I'm going to record this. Anybody who could, okay, too late. It's being recorded. So whoever doesn't like that, um, I don't know. Leave, I guess. Um, okay, so today's speaker is Andrea Pizzi from Cambridge. Uh, I mean, you can see his title. Title. I'm not going to introduce him because um, I guess this is not formal enough for this. So with this, please, Andrea. Uh, one other comment is, uh, if you have any questions and so on, feel free to interrupt um, and ask the speaker. This makes it livelier and more um, sort of interactive. All right. So, Andrea. Perfect. Thank you very much, Achilles. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to talk today. Yes, as you said, indeed, um, please do interrupt me at any time for any uh, comment or question. And today we'll talk about a very recent work which I've been doing in collaboration with Andras Nunenkamp and Jonas Knolle, that are at Nottingham and uh, TUM Munich, respectively, and that will appear most likely uh, on the archive on Friday. Um, you see the title here. So this talk is about classical prethermal phases of matter in dimension one, two, and three. And I mean, for sure you have seen the this classical as a bar on top, and, and we will move to that very soon. Indeed, that's the first point of the introduction. So in the beginning, we will consider the issue of classical versus quantum, taking the taking thermization as an example. And that's a good warm up to then move to pre-thermization of which we will see the unusual history. And then we will move to uh, a brief overview of pre-thermization and discrete time crystals and pre-thermal discrete time crystals. And so without further ado, let's uh, get into this. All right, so let's consider thermization in closed dynamics. I mean, I'm sure people in the audience here are uh, experts of this, but let's just quickly recall what this is. So as I understand it, thermization is in, in the closed dynamics of a system, of a genetic minimal system, is basically the property for which after a transient dynamic, dynamics, um, the expectation value of local observable reaches um, a stationary value which depends only on the system's energy. I mean, this at, at least for gener generic systems. And so we can interpret this system, system's energy as the temperature of the system. Um, and thermization can be explained from both a, a classical perspective and the quantum one. So classically, we know the equation of motion is the Newton's one, and, and which is basically a nonlinear equation um, of size of order n, where n is the number of elementary constituents in the system. In this case, the key mathematical feature which is allowing for uh, thermization is chaos and ergodicity. Uh, and then, you know, it follows the microcanonical ensemble, the equivalence with the canonical ensemble, and so on and so forth. In the quantum, quantum setting, instead, we have the, delete, the, the main equation is the Schrodinger equation. Um, and the problem here, the puzzling thing here is that this is linear. So it's not super clear how thermization can occur in this case. Um, but now because this equation has a very large dimensionality, which is exponential in the system size, there is actually a mechanism which is very nicely explaining how thermization can still happen. Um, and this is basically the eigenstate thermization hypothesis. So is thermization a classical phenomenon or a quantum phenomenon? Um, well, I like to think about it as uh, none of the two. In a way, th this is just a, rem a remark on nomenclature, if you want. Um, but I like to think that the tags classical and quantum are good tags for theories, whereas the phenom phenomenon is kind of the same, and the phenomenon is about experiments. So uh, in a way, the phenomenon is not classical nor quantum, and indeed, all models are wrong, but just some are useful. So I like to think about classical and quantum approaches to the phenomenon of thermalization, and this is why I was putting a bar on top of the, of the classical in front of pre-thermization in the title. Okay, so we have two approaches to, to thermization here. And which one came first? Well, of course, uh, the history of thermization starts from the classical setting, just because it's much older, uh, much easier. Um, and indeed it was done already more than, than a century ago by these two gentlemen that for sure you recognize. And, and only much later uh, did the quantum approach uh, came. And surprisingly enough, curiously enough, I would say, uh, the converse is true 
for a related phenomenon, which is the one of prethermization. And in fact, in this case, it was first studied, uh, first, was, first the quantum approach was used, and then the classical one was used. And this is a bit surprising because, you know, the classical setting is easier. It's just easier to study. Um, and the reason why it was first done from the quantum side, I guess, might be related with the, the tradition and the history uh, of uh, Floquet engineering, which was uh, getting the attention on, on periodically driven systems from the quantum side. And this is why it was discovered there first. And now, but because of this unusual history, then because quantum mechanics is tough, to study numerically and because the classical approach is in, in its infancy, well then most likely there is still lots to learn left uh, about pre-thermization and especially about pre-thermization with a classical approach, which is the topic of this talk. So because it's important, because we, we want to study this pre-thermization, then let's spend a few words on, on it. So in essence, um, the setting in which we want to work is that of uh, many body system under periodic drive. And now many body systems under periodic drive uh, tend to heat, so tend to reach the so-called infinite temperature state, which is a featureless state uh, where, which is, yeah, indeed the one at infinite temperature. And, and yet this fate can be evaded for a long time, for a very long time when the drive frequency is very large. So when the drive frequency is large, then the local energy scales then there can be a very long so-called pre-thermal regime anticipating the heat death. And the idea is that this pre-thermal regime can be used to realize some uh, novel non-equilibrium phases of matter that have no classical, no, no, no counterpart in the equilibrium setting. For instance, one example are pre-thermal discrete time crystals that as in the case of pre-thermalization, also pre-thermal discrete time crystals followed this uh, curious inverted history. So they were first studied from a quantum approach, uh, from a quantum perspective. And so taking this reference as the main example, uh, we can consider, for instance, a binary drive like the one here, where in the first part, we have some interaction, some ZZ interaction, which is in one dimension and with long range uh, tails and some integrability breaking term V. Whereas the second part of the Hamiltonian consists basically of a transverse feed, which is implementing a pi flip of the spins. So what happens is that at every period we are flipping the spins by an angle pi. So if we start with the spins mostly aligned along the z direction, so we start with magnetization plus one here, then after a period we go to magnetization minus one, and then back to magnetization plus one, and so on and so forth. And now the point is that because of this integrability breaking terms, Actually, there are mistakes accumulating and the system is actually heating up. And therefore we see a decay in these envelopes and the magnetization will soon enough reach the infinite temperature value equal to uh, zero. Now, the deal here is that when we increase the frequency, we have that this subharmonic response at frequency one half of the drive is lasting for longer and longer and longer. And this is what, why uh, in this pre-thermal regime, the uh, discrete time translation asymmetry of the drive is broken by a factor two, if you want. And, and therefore, with this period double response, we can talk about a uh, pre thermal discrete time crystal. So, sorry, uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, the integrability term uh, that you use here, what, uh, what integrability are you breaking exactly? So, because if, um, are, are you asking how this looks like? Or how, yeah, basically why in this... principle, yes. Okay, so I mean, this could be say some XX interaction or uh, longitudinal, some XX interaction or some fields along X and, and, and Z. I mean, in principle, it's a mixture of all these terms. You just put them with some small enough coefficients. And okay, so in principle, them. you're saying the integrability class here is because I don't have a transverse field, even though I have long range interactions and the ZZ interaction. I can solve this exactly because I don't have a transverse field, right? Right, right, yeah. Because I mean, if you because if you just have just these red and green terms, then uh, and then and you start from a product state in Z, right? Then the ZZ interaction will not change it. Whereas this pi flip is just leading you to a, a product state in Z to its complementary, which is flipped. Okay, so the, the reason I'm just a little bit confused here is because I mean. In this case, for alpha not zero or infinity, basically your pi flip is an integrability breaking term. 
but the pi flip is alternating with the interaction, okay? So they are not acting at the same time. Ah, right, okay, yeah, I see, okay. But in principle, you can also add it as V, right? You can add another term there and this would be breaking integrability, correct? Yeah, yeah, correct. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, sorry, this just, just to just to continue that question. Yeah, if please. if omega is not exactly a pi flip, then you don't need v, right? And alpha is right, right, correct. So uh, I mean, if if omega is uh, okay, so this omega is the drive frequency, and okay, so let's put it this way: if you put a factor one plus epsilon here, then this is already uh, breaking the integrability. Yes. So in the rest of the talk, um, should I think of the spin flip term as being exactly equal to? Uh, okay. The well, flip? well, we I guess this will be clarified soon enough because this is just say the a reference model for this introduction. But then I will just show you the model I will consider in which we will see explicitly also perturbations to this term. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So. With, this concludes my introduction, and, and I just want to tell you um, to outline which are the three main take -home messages that I would like to convey in the remainder of the talk. The first one is that a classical theory is useful to describe preterminization and related phenomena. The second is that because the classical theory has much less severe finite size effects, then you can study many more spins than in a quantum case and you can study any dimensionality basically. And therefore, there are lots of very interesting phenomena that become accessible, uh, that becomes, let's say, more easily accessible. And third is that, for instance, in this way, we can give the first numerical demonstration of a pre-thermal discrete and crystal with short range interaction, which requires dimensionality two and three. Okay, so let's move to, to the results section and let's get into the actual results. We will first see the model that we will consider. Then we will compare classical and quantum approaches by taking the one dimensional case with long range interactions. And then we will move to study higher order discrete and crystals in short range interacting systems in dimension two and three. And finally, um, I will try to flex a bit by showcasing basically all the dimensionalities one, two, and three from short to long range interactions, which is, I mean, it's possible just because the system is classical. So, uh, numerics is much easier. As for the model, we consider um, we want to consider Hamiltonian dynamics, and therefore we start by writing the Hamiltonian. And here, I guess, I answer the last question. Um, so we see again a binary drive which is inspired by the model that I showed you before for the quantum model for the quantum system. Um, and here, basically, we have some ZZ interaction between spins, with some which is which, which is possibly long range where R, I, uh, ij is the distance between the two sides and alpha is the power law uh, exponent. But this can be a sum in any dimensionality, okay? So these indexes are running uh, on hypercubes, say. And then there is also a longitudinal term here. Uh, and then we have the transverse feed, which is flipping the spins in the second part of the drive. Okay, let's make clear a few terms in these in this sums. So first of all, we have this normalization uh, calligraphic N alpha, which is written down here. This is some so-called CAC normalization, which is basically just making sure that this sum will take, the, the maximum value of this sum is one. Um, and I like to use this normalization because then when, whenever you change your, in your power law exponent alpha or your dimensionality, uh, no matter of the, the dimensionality or of alpha, you will always have that this sum will take at most value one. So in a way, you always have the same uh, strength, overall strength of the interaction. And then we see that here we have this, uh, the transverse field is equal to two omega G, okay? So before we only had omega, now we have two omega G. So the idea is that we want to parameterize it in this way, such that uh, G basically indicates the rotation the rotation angle of the spins and it's frequency independent. So if you can change the frequency, but the rotation that will be caused by this uh, term will always be equal to two pi times G. So for G equal to one half, we get back to the previous case in which we have pi flips of the spins. And we can also make mistake now, mistakes because we can take G equal to 0 0.49 and we will make a mistake 
as um, you asked earlier. Okay, here you can see just a pictorial uh, schematic of the system in the case of two dimensions, whereas here you see the binary drive uh, just a schematic. As for the initial condition, uh, we take one in which the spins are almost all aligned along Z, but then perturbed randomly. So what we do is basically we tip every spin by a polar angle theta, which is drawn randomly from a Gaussian distribution with standard deviation two pi times W. Whereas the azimuthal angle phi is completely random. In a way, we can think to this W as a temperature. Indeed, if W is equal to zero, then all the spins will be exactly aligned along Z and there will be no randomness at all actually. And we can think to this as the zero temperature state if you want. And now if you increase W, we put more and more energy into the system and we disalign the spins and we, we scramble them. And just a final remark, these spins are uh, have modulus one and the modulus is conserved. So they are just undergoing some sort of precession dynamics. Uh, but the modulus of each spin is equal to one. So they live on a sphere. And now from the Hamiltonian, we can obtain the dynamics. And we do so by just taking some Hamilton equation, which makes use of Poisson brackets, and which gives us some ordinary differential equation, which is uh, basically three n dimensional, because we have three components for every classical spin. And this this uh, ODE is pretty simple. Basically, it consists of some precession dynamics. In the first part of the drive, we have precession around the z-axis. In the second part of the drive, we have precession around the x-axis. And the second part is pretty easy. Of course, you have precession around the x-axis because you have a filter along x. But in the first part, uh, this is where the coupling between the spins uh, comes out. Indeed, this kappa i is an effective field, which is composed of the longitudinal field h plus a term which is coming from the interactions. And now because during the, these dynamics, the z component of the spins is conserved, then uh, it's actually very simple to just integrate the dynamics uh, on both the, the two halves of the drive. So we can just write that this, the spin at, at time nt plus capital T is equal to a rotation of the, say a sequence of two rotations around the z-axis and x-axis of the spins at time nt. It's just that the coefficients of this rotation contain, contain kappa i, where the coupling with the other spins uh, comes into play. But now the thing is that in this way, the dynamics is actually very efficient. We don't have to integrate any ODE. We are just basically applying this nonlinear function iteratively. And every time we apply the nonlinear function on this uh, three n degrees of freedom, we get uh, we we move forward in time by a time capital T. And now that we have these dynamics, we can wonder about computing some observables. In particular, very obvious observables we, Sorry, we uh, want question? to look at. Yeah, please. Um, so in between your first half of the period, uh, you are assuming that the uh, other spins don't really rotate because the effective field that you are using basically is taken from the beginning of the period. Right, so um, the reason why this is possible is that this dynamics is conserving the Z component of the fields. And therefore, even the, eff even the effective field, which contains the, the coupling with the other spins, it's also constant. So all the Z components of the spins are conserved. And so they just act yeah, as a Z field. A constant one. Um, but uh, does that also guarantee that the kappas are uh, conserved throughout? Sorry, again? Uh, does that guarantee that the kappas are also conserved throughout? Yeah, I guess it does. Okay, right, yeah. yes, Thanks. exactly. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Exactly. Yeah, perfect. So um, we were saying the observables of interest are the obvious ones. So we can look at the first alpha Hamiltonian, which is just the one you know, uh, giving this part of the motion. We can look at the average Hamiltonian over one period. We can look at the magnetization, uh, which we mean along the z direction, and at its Fourier transform m tilde of omega prime. And here we use omega prime just not to confuse with the drive frequency, which is omega instead. Um, this kind of concludes our model, but actually there is one more observable, which is a crucial one. 
and which we call the D correlator. So this D correlator D is measuring the distance between two copies of the system. And these two copies of the system are taken to be very similar at initial, at initial time. So at time t equal to zero, we take S prime to be a perturbation of S, and this perturbation is of strength of order, say, delta. And this delta is very, very small, much smaller than one, and also much smaller than W, that was the perturbation of the, with the, of the polar angles, basically. So here you see the spin S and the spin S prime and their differences of order delta. Um, and now this decorrelator is useful in two ways. So at short times, we can see whether this D is growing for a very small value, which is in the order of delta, it's growing exponentially. And if so, and this is usually the case, then we can probe, we can probe sensitivity to the initial condition, which is basically the Hallamark of chaos. Whereas at long times, um, we can look whether this D reaches the infinite temperature value, the infinity. So this infinite temperature value is the one that you obtain when you put, when you compute this quantity by just putting completely random orientations for the spins SI and the spins SI prime. And if you do so, you realize that D infinity is equal to square root of two. So whenever D reaches this value, square root of two, then we know that we have reached the infinite temperature state. All right, so with this in, in mind, we can move to the actual data. And we will start as promised by a comparison between the classical approach and the quantum approach to prethermal discrete and crystals in one dimension. So we take D equal to one. Now we take G, which is close to one half so that the, the flips uh, caused by the transverse field as are uh, pi flips or almost pi flips. Uh, and so that we are looking to period doubling discrete and crystals. As a quantum model, we take basically this figure from this paper here. Whereas for the classical case, we take our own results. We investigate three scenarios, which are the three columns in both cases. The first column, the first scenario is the one of short range interactions. So alpha equal to infinity, uh, just contact interactions. Well, nearest neighbor interactions. Um, the second scenario is the one of long range interactions. For instance, alpha equal to 1.5. This is what we consider here in our case. And a cold initial condition, where with cold, we mean that there are, there are uh, the energy of the initial condition is low, is far from the infinite temperature one. The first scenario is the one of long range interactions, but with a hot initial condition. In the case of the, in the classical case, the cold and hot are encoded into this parameter W, which was, as we said, the strength of the perturbation of the tipping, say, of the, of the spins at initial time. So for W equal to 0 0.1, we can consider the system to be cold, whereas for a stronger perturbation 0 0.2, we say the system to be hot. The models considered in these two cases are actually different, but just slightly different. And the physics, what I want to show here is that the physics is very similar. So first of all, we can look at the energy, which is the first row. And we see that no matter of the scenario, and no matter of whether it's quantum or classical, uh, we always see pre-termization, meaning that the energy takes an exponentially long in frequency time to decay to its infinite temperature value zero. Here you see the scaling with the frequency. But now one thing is pre-thermalization, which always occurs. And one thing is having a non-trivial pre-thermal phase of matter, like a discrete time crystal. And this is less obvious. And indeed, if you have a short range interacting model in one dimension, you see that nothing really happens here because at first you do have this going from magnetization equal to plus one to minus one at every period and back. So you do have this subharmonic response, but this is lasting for a very short time. And soon enough, this magnetization goes to the infinite temperature value, even if the, the state of the system is actually not yet at the infinite temperature uh, state. So no subharmonic response is possible. And this is different from the long range case instead, because here you see that you do have the subharmonic response, and then now the duration of this subharmonic response is increasing um, with the frequency of the drive. So in this case, prethermalization does correspond to a non-trivial prethermal phase of matter, that is uh, a period doubling, period doubled time crystal. And now if we are in long range, but for hot initial condition, we see that basically we are, it's kind of equivalent to being in, in the short range case. So again, no scaling of the subharmonic response is possible. And therefore this is kind of a trivial prethermalization. 
So this was the quantum case. And now you see that in the classical case, you get really essentially the same. So you get no scaling of the magnetization in the short range case, scaling in the long range with cold initial condition, and no scaling in the long range with hot initial condition. One extra observable here in the quantum case is the bipartite entanglement entropy, which is showing some um, pre-thermal finite temperature plateau before heading to the infinite temperature value. Of course, bipartite entanglement, bipartite entanglement entropy is a very quantum uh, quantity. And so we, do not, we cannot check this in our classical model. But we like to think about the decorrelator in analogy to the entanglement entropy. So the, this distance between two initially very close copies of the system. And we see that this is intriguingly uh, similar because again, we see some finite temperature plateau before the ultimate heating to the infinite temperature value. Question. Now, yes, please. Sorry, I, I missed it and I cannot really read the labels. What yes. is controlling the time scale in your pictures? The time scale is getting longer from, I don't know, like purple to, to green. Right, so this is, this is omega here. Ah, this is the okay. drive frequency. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's definitely a good question because this is important. So here, the, the key thing is, is the scaling with frequency, really. If you increase the frequency, you have a longer pre-thermization time and also in this case, a longer pre-thermal subharmonic response. Now, the take home message of this slide um, is, is one. And I hope I have, I managed to deliver the first take home message that is, a classical theory is useful to describe pre-thermization and related phenomena, where related phenomena here are basically pre-thermal discrete time crystals. Just by this comparison, I hope to have delivered this message. So it seems to me that um, this, this phenomena here, these pre-thermal discrete time crystals, which are in the absence of disorder. So this, are, this is very different from many body localized discrete time crystals, which are uh, you know, relying on disorder and uh, persisting up to infinite, to infinite time. Um, so it seems that the physics here instead is robust to quantum fluctuations rather than due to quantum fluctuations. And if this is the case, then a classical theory is very informative about the physics that is going on. And therefore the idea is, is obvious. Then let's use class a classical theory like the one that we have to study the phenomena that are the mostly, the, the, say the most hardly accessible in a quantum theory. Um, and in particular, I have in mind higher order discrete time crystals in higher dimension. Question. Um, question. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, sorry, go, go ahead, Juan. No, just it. super simple. Um, what, how, how big are the systems and what happens with size? I know that they are long range, but still. Right, so uh, in this case, in the quantum case, I guess, okay, one should yeah, check yeah. there, but I guess it's 28 sites. In the classical one, uh, I don't remember what I used here, but it's in the hundred of you know thousands, and I will give okay. you some numbers Shut later. Up. It's even larger. Okay, thanks. And we do also have some scaling with system size uh, that check that checks basically whether everything is consistent. So there was another question. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I just want to understand this um, your take home message slightly better. So these classical equation of equations of motion that you have been using for the spins, I mean, there was a paper or there were few papers in the last two or three years, which basically did the same thing, but for a Heisenberg model with sort of XXZ type interaction, but classically, which showed that a very similar decorrelator actually shows the same um, light, score, light cone scaling and so on as the quantum OTOC shows, right? Mm -hmm. So, but, um, and it's sort of understood that why the OTOC does what it does in the quantum case, and it sort of is understood why the classical decorrelator does what it does in the classical case. But that doesn't really mean that the two things are the same, right? Because if that is the same, then are you saying that there is nothing like quantum information or quantum entanglement and uh, something like that? Right, so, right. Can you clarify that a bit? So I guess uh, what I'm trying to say here is that um, if I take a system and uh, which is microscopic, uh, then, of course, you know, quantum physics is applying and therefore there will be some quantum correlations and there will be some entanglement and there will be some truly quantum, genuine quantum properties that the classical system will miss. Uh, but the point here is that the, 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 the thing of interest, which is pre-termization, is not missed instead. So, of course, there are some features which are quantum which you miss, but 
uh, it turns out, you know, as I said before, like all models, quoting this, you know, mainstream upper is, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And here I'm trying to say that a classical model can be very useful to describe pre-thermalization and pre-thermal phases of matter. Even though there are, it, it is missing some quantum features. But do you think this is, I'm sorry to jump in, I mean, but, but do you think this is general? I mean, because here I can easily believe that what you say is true because you're dealing with long range models. So it's not surprising that you can have sort of effectively, you know, mean field slash classical slash whatever you want to call them descriptions. But are you saying that you believe this to be generally true for pre-thermal phases? I mean, I mean, it might be true. I just never thought about it, but are you saying this? Yeah, sorry, just to, just to follow up on that question. I mean, uh, part of, I was going to say that, I mean, yes, you have two oh, variables which seem to do the same thing, but uh, how do I understand that the underlying mechanisms is the same? I mean, it's like, it's like, um, it's like the opening example of thermalization, right? So the underlying mechanism must be different because the math is different. But then, you know, if you, if, and then if you come up with a new theory, which is not classical, nor quantum is uh, another theory, is the super quantum theory, then there will be a new mechanism. So, but the mechanism is depending on the theory, um, whereas the phenomenon is kind of fixed. And now the question is whether your model can give you some information on the phenomenon. And the origin of these two explanations is different, but then it turns out both can give you some information on it. I mean, just to sort of, because I think I understand what I was asking. I mean, you know, I, of course you're right that some level descriptions at different levels have to sort of be essentially independent of the level underneath. But I mean, just like, if you see something oscillating in time, that doesn't, I'm not saying this applies to this, but if you see something oscillating in time, that doesn't mean it's a time crystal because it's other, things that you would need to look at to check if it's a time crystal. So, you know, a pendulum and what you're showing is not the same thing, right? Because what you're showing has other problems. So it's not, I mean, I guess it's, it's unclear to me also as it apparently is to, to, to Sadadi who just asked the question. Okay, yes, the plots you're showing are the same, but why do you think these two phenomena are actually the same apart from that? that that's, I guess, I think I'm just repeating his question. And then the other question I ask is actually dependent. I mean, do you actually think that, uh, Thermalization, not in long range systems can actually be understood in classical terms. I think that, that these are also going questions, right? I'm not asking you to. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you can uh, also not, not answer them now, continue, and we can discuss it at the end. I mean, we don't need right. to, <laughs> if you prefer. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, it, uh, okay, yes, let's let's discuss this in the end, okay? So let's take some more time to, because I, I, I guess this is really interesting. It's a like discussion. Be, it's a discussion, actually, to be had. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's yeah. 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 But for now, for now, I guess, I guess we should agree on the fact that you know, both approaches have something to say about this phenomenon. Uh, this should be pretty clear in the same way as they do for therm for thermalization. Okay. So indeed, we want to use it for uh, studying this uh, hard, say, le less accessible phenomena. So in particular, let's start with higher order discrete time crystals. So now in contrast to before, we take uh, a G, which is not equal to one half, but to one fourth. So here we have pi half flips rather than pi flips. And now because we have pi half flips, we are basically rotating into four positions on the sphere. And we would like to, to have a better way of encoding in color these various positions. So what we do, and we do this for dimension two and short range interactions, uh, is the following. We try to, to, to make a color encoding of the sphere. We try to associate uh, one color, one uni unique color to every point of the sphere on which each spin can live. So if the spin has uh, orientation plus Y, then we are here and we, we will have a color blue. Plus Z, we will have a color red. Minus Y, yellow. Minus Z, green. And now if we are instead aligned along plus X, then it means we have S, S, Y, and S, Z equal to zero. We are in the center of the spheres of these circles. And now if we are on plus X, we are on this side. So we have white. Whereas if we have minus X, we are on this side that is black. So we have a color for every possible orientation. And if we start with spins, which are mostly aligned along the Z direction, we will see a configuration of the spins on a two dimensional grid. This is like 200 times 200, and every pixel is a different spin. Uh, we will have mostly red coloring. 
And after one period, we have done a pi al flip and we have moved to this point of the sphere. So we have mostly yellow. And then we move to this point of the sphere, mostly green and then mostly blue. And then we repeat. So far, so good. I mean, this is pretty, pretty trivial. We are just flipping by an angle pi half uh, the spins at every period. And now the thing is that this alternation of colors is lasting for uh, long enough. So after 1,000 1, periods, we still see the same kind of alternation of color, even if now the colors are a bit more dirty, if you want. Um, after a very long time, we start seeing instead the emergence of domain walls and domains with different magnetizations. And, and this is a route to the ultimate thermalization where each pixel is just one of the, of the colors, colors mentioned before at random. Uh, now, the key thing is that these two time scales are separated by one over lambda, where lambda is the Lyapunov exponent of chaos, okay? The one that we said before for the decorrelator. And because of this, and this will become clear anyway later, we can say that this part refers to pre-thermalizing, pre-thermalization. This part is pre-thermal. This part is about thermalizing, that is melting, if you want, of the, of the discrete and crystal. And then we get to a fully thermal configuration. And because it takes four periods for the system configuration to repeat, or let's say for the magnetization uh, to get the same positive value, then we would say that this is, a, this is a four discrete time crystal. And now we can consider, uh, for instance, even dimensionality equal to three, again, short range interactions. And now to, respond, to, to reply to one uh, question, we have a system size which is 50 times 50 times 50 spins. So, you know, order 10 to the five spins. So a very large one. And we can consider various uh, strength of the transverse field G. So we started from G equal to 1.4 and now we can perturb it a bit. And we see that even when, when we perturb it, we still see that the frequency of the, of the system is equal to one fourth of the drive frequency. So there is this plateau, which is uh, signaling uh, the robustness of this subharmonic response of the four discrete time crystal. And we can actually also do it for other values of G, for instance, one third, for which the frequency of the system is one third of the drive frequency for a, an entire plateau. So this would correspond to a three discrete time crystal. And we see that even fractional values are possible, like, if, like for this small plateau here. And then we also have the two DTC, which is a bit more common in which you have period doubling. So we see that basically when G, the strength of the transverse field is close to one over N, you can get N discrete time crystals where the period is uh, N tuple as compared to the one of the drive. And therefore a zoo of clean pre-thermal discrete time crystals uh, is possible now, which is in contrast to MBL discrete time crystals, which are completely different, but in which uh, only period doubling is possible. And I hope that this slide uh, has delivered the second take on message. That is that now many spins are possible in any dimensionality and phenomena uh, and lots of phenomena become accessible. For instance, these higher order discrete time crystals that in the quantum case are uh, very hard to study because as we have showed here, uh, they can only appear for system sizes which are uh, way beyond those in the reach of exact diagonalization. So can I ask again something? Uh, sure. So why do you say that uh, only in MBL only two DTCs are possible because you think your spins one half. Correct. So, but I mean, I can take, you know, parafermionic models or- Fair. And yeah. people have, uh, well, because I mean, at the end of the day here, the reason you can have is partly is because you're not restricted to spin one half. Mm -hmm. uh, this is correct. So that, that's, I mean, that's a feature, let's say, that's a feature that allows you to have N entities rather than the mechanism by which you stabilize the entire thing, right? That's- I agree. So I agree. And indeed, like, what we did here was we defined these higher order discrete time crystals as, as basically um, time crystals with, where the periodicity is larger than the size of the local Hilbert space. So, you know, if you, are, if you have spin, spin one half, you are limited to n equal to two, but now the higher order are going beyond this. And then I agree with what you said, if you have parafermionic models uh, or clock models, um, you can go to larger periods anyway. Um, sorry, sorry, I missed the part about the local Hilbert space. You have classical spins, right? So, for right, time. yes. So, okay. So, uh, the thing is, these higher order discrete time crystals were defined in the quantum setting here. 
in which case the local size, the size of the local hyperspace made sense. And now we, we are making a jump to the classical model to study the same phenomena. Um, Indeed, okay, so, here the, there is the, no the plots that, so the plots that you have here are for the quantum case. No, this is classical. Um, I see, okay. Okay, so, um, all right. So now this being said, I mean, so far I've shown this subharmonic response, but it's not super clear why we should think about this uh, as a prethermal for DTC. And so let's just get a bit, have a closer look to the, to the case of period four tuppling here. And we do it for the three dimensional case with short range interactions. And we look at various observables that we introduced before. So the first one is energy. And we just see that energy is kind of almost conserved for a very long time before going down and dropping to the infinite temperature value, which is zero. I mean, not surprising. Now the magnetization is what is showing really the subharmonic response and therefore the time crystal in nature, if you want of this phenomenon. Um, and you see here, we are using a linear scale for this first part of the axis and the logarithmic scale for this second part of the axis. So here you see the period for tapping. It takes four periods for the magnetization to go from almost one to almost one again. Uh, and this subharmonic response lasts for the whole prethermal regime. But perhaps more, even more strikingly, we can understand what's going on with the decorrelator, which is measuring the distance between the two initially closed copies of the system. And so here, what we see is that this distance is increasing exponentially quickly at short times with a power low exponent lambda, which is basically the Lyapunov exponent. But then rather than heading to the infinite temperature value straight away, it is uh, plateauing to a finite value, which is say 60% of the infinite temperature one. And then only much later, it's going to the infinite temperature value. And, and this separation of time scales is, is, the, is the key. So you see that the thermization time is much longer than the pre-thermization time, which is instead associated with the lambda, the Lyapunov exponent lambda of chaos. And, and so it's crucial to understand how these two time scales change with frequency now. And we just do it. We just plot the decorrelator for various frequencies. And here again, we have the axes are broken again into linear parts and logarithmic parts. So let's start from this shaded area here. This is basically a semi-log Y plot. So only the vertical direction is in, in logarithmic scale. And so we see these straight lines indicating the exponential growth of the decorrelator. This is nothing but chaos. And now the slope of these lines does depend a bit on frequency in the beginning, but when the frequency is large enough, you see that all these lines are collapsing onto the same one, which is say the infinite frequency line. Because when frequency is large, the dynamics here is ruled by an effective Hamiltonian, which is say the lowest order one from the Magnus expansion. And this uh, Hamiltonian then becomes time independent. It's just an effective time independent Hamiltonian to which you can associate a Lyapunov exponent uh, lambda, which is the one for chaos, okay? for a quench with this effective Hamiltonian. And so this lambda is setting the slope of these lines for high frequency. But very different is what, what's happening afterwards. And so we go to this part of the plot, which is instead in semi-log X axis, where the time axis is logarithmic, whereas the, the correlator axis is linear. And here you see that for increasing frequency, the thermalization time is taking, uh, is, is uh, larger and larger, basically exponentially frequency it looks like. And, and so this mismatch in scaling is the key, is the key part. And, and then we can also plot possibly the other observables like magnetization and uh, energy. And we do so only at stroboscopic times, which are multiples of 40, uh, because we are looking at the four discrete and crystal. And we see again the scaling. But I guess the decorrelator is the one that really is giving you the strongest insight into this. And now we can be a bit more quantitative and define the pre-thermization time scale and the thermization time scale as the times at which the decorrelator is crossing the 10% of, of its infinite temperature value and the 90% of its infinite temperature value. We can do this. We can plot, it, plot the, two, the two time scales versus frequency. And we see uh, what we said. So the pre-thermization time scale is not scaling with omega, whereas the thermization time scale is. And in this uh, space in between, you have this subharmonic response.
and because of this clear separation of time scales, uh, I guess this is giving you uh, the evidence for the third take-home message. That is that here now we can finally have a numerical demonstration of uh, short-range pre-thermal discrete time crystals, which require dimensionality two or three. And, and finally, uh, we can move to flexing a bit, as I promised. That just means basically, you know, because it's classical and we can, we have very little constraints on, on system size and dimensionality, we can basically just look at uh, very many parameters and, and draw some phase diagrams. For instance, we can take as a order parameter for the phase diagram, the, uh, the component of the Fourier transform of the magnetization at frequency omega over four, so the subharmonic one. And in this way, we can probe the four DTC. And we can, for instance, look at uh, phase diagrams in the plane of the magnetic field strength G, which is you know, the strength of the transverse field, and the power law exponent alpha in the three dimensionalities. For instance, in dimensionality D equal to one, we see that we need alpha smaller than two to have a four DTC. And this is uh, actually not by chance, this is linked to uh, a correspondence that there is between pre-thermal DTCs and equilibrium phase transitions. And then we have to be at G around 0 0.25 to have the 4DTC. Um, instead, for D equal to 2 and D equal to 3, we see that the 4DTC is, ex is extending all the way to alpha equal to infinity. And I mean, actually, yeah, this is not really happening here. Uh, it's not super clear. But the reason why this is not visible here is just that we consider a frequency which is not large enough. If you just increase a bit the frequency, then you will see that this is expanding up to here. And this is actually uh, highlighting uh, a warning here that is, these phase diagrams are actually slightly ill-defined because to define a pre-thermal phase of matter, I guess you should really check how things scale with omega, which we did in the previous slide, but not here. So here we are just considering a, a single omega. And fair enough, but I guess it, this can still be informative. Um, and here instead we consider again, G on the X axis and the period T on the Y axis. And we see that when the period is too large, that is the frequency is too small, then there is no subharmonic response. And then only after a certain uh, frequency, you start seeing the 4DTC. Okay, with this, I come to the summary and conclusion. So um, I showed you a model for efficient classical Hamiltonian dynamics, where you just have Hamilton equations that then you can integrate over one period so that you just have to uh, apply an linear mapping to evolve the system by a period uh, of the drive. And then I try to deliver three messages. The first one is that a classical theory is useful to describe pre-thermalization and related phenomena. The second one is that uh, because we lifted the finite side constraints, then we can study many spins, dimensionalities, and phenomena. For instance, higher order discrete time crystals. And I would argue that this is then very relevant for experiments because you know if I have an experiment which is in 3D, I would like to have some numerics. The quantum one is very tough, but I can still do a classical one and uh, perhaps this is telling me lots about the physics uh, that is going on. And third, um, I try to show you that uh, you can have, uh, you, can, you can show very clearly this separation of time scales and therefore prove um, a, a pre-thermal discrete and crystal in dimensionality uh, two and three with short range interactions. And as an outlook for future research, uh, I would just say, well, it would be interesting to see whether there are other other kind of pre-thermal phenomena and pre-thermal phases of matter beyond discrete and crystals that can be captured by um, a classical model. For instance, I, I would say in dimensionality two and three in particular, that, that's where it will be the most interesting uh, to look at. And with this, I conclude. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. So, um, so if I understood in this 3D, you have short range, then you see this long, long lived pre-thermal phase, you, you know, state you call it, and then you melt at much, much longer times. How do you melt? Right, so I guess the melting is, so let's say here I showed it in 2D, but in 3D is similar. Uh, so this is the melting here. Okay, so basically you have nucleation of domains with opposite magnetization. And then you break into pieces that are smaller and smaller and smaller until arriving to just completely uncorrelated spins. 
So I'm going to speculate, and this might be completely wrong, but because you have this very long-lived state, and then you eventually go to whatever the you know the equilibrium is. Um, I would have thought that these long dynamics must be heterogeneous in space, and this is analogous to most things which are slow. If you're slow with short range interactions, your dynamics, your relaxation dynamics is is very highly heterogeneous. It's not that you know the whole system doesn't homogeneously adjust to the equilibrium state. But it happens in you know spatially segregated pockets and eventually it percolates all the way through. So I cannot tell from looking at this picture whether that's the case or not. Yeah. Right. So, you, so you're basically are you asking why this is non-heterogeneous? Is this basically no, no, I'm just speculating that I would expect that the relaxation is very highly heterogeneous. The question is how you measure it. You know, what's the field that's heterogeneous in space as you? you know, as, as you're moving away from, from what you call the pre-thermal state. So I was wondering whether you had thought about this, because in analogy with many other slow systems, that's what should happen. I see. Okay, well, um, so first of all, I guess, um, the reason why I don't see it to being heterogeneous in space here is that it's basically coming from the fact that we consider initial condition with randomized spins, okay? And the, depending on the specific realization of the randomized spins, then you will end up with uh, a red pocket here or a yellow one or a green one, depending on the initial condition. So if you run this multiple times, you get different configurations here. Uh, so for one, one could do an, an, an average over ensemble of initial conditions and it would make it more homogeneous. And you would just see, and then you would just basically get magnetization, which is decaying to zero rather than fluctuating. Um, and for two, the second thing that one can do is if you take the system size, which is really going to infinity, and then you average over, over space, you know, you, you make a moving average over space, then this will smoothen things, even though, yeah, yeah, I guess this would be the case. I'm not sure if this answers your question, though. I mean, usually what you have to measure is something that has that, that has many, you know, it's a multi-point correlation function, like two points in space and two points in time. Because what you're trying to probe is that there is some spatial, some time correlation between things with whose order you don't really know. So you so you took a space correlator, you know, the two points in space correlated to two points at, an, at, an, at another point in time. So, mm -hmm. uh, okay, I need to think a little bit, but I think that this is kind of, I would expect that dynamics to be there in some, in some form. Okay. Okay. I should, I would also think more about this. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Juan, sorry, just to follow up on that. If you, if you measure something like an intersample versus intrasample as a function of time, do you expect to see peaks? So, sorry, some a what? In time? In a what? An intrasample? Something like an intersample fluctuation versus, or, or yeah, in, inters, or inter, I, I don't know which one is the right one here, but one that measures the fluctuations for a given initial condition within the system. So, you know, practically speaking, you just measure what is the variance of your order parameter across the sample for a given initial condition. And then you average that variance over several initial conditions and see if that, you know, grows at some time p. That would suggest that the system is becoming heterogeneous, as one was pointing out. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if you have measured something like that or not. Uh, I, we didn't, but I mean, uh, we didn't, but I see your point. I will think more about this. But yeah, we didn't. Because the thing is that usually, I mean, these questions make little sense in the quantum case where it's like 20 spins or whatever. But you have very large systems, so and then you seem to be able to do statistics as well. So, so that's why these spatial, you know, spatial aspects of the dynamics become, mm -hmm. you know, become accessible. Right. Yeah. One can one can definitely look for, um, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, for some correlation fun for some correlation length uh, versus time. I guess there is a. I mean, definitely there is a way to look at this. And you're right, now you have large system sizes, so you can, it makes sense to look at longer and longer distances.
All right. Uh, are there any other questions? All right. With that, let me conclude the formal sort of part of this to the extent that this was formal.